My name is Rachel Silva and I work for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Thank you for coming and welcome to the Sandwiching and History Tour of the Roselle Murphy House. I want to thank a few people before we get started. First of all, I want to thank John Emerson over here. Raise your hand, John. At Emerson Pointer Law Firm for allowing us to come in and tour their offices today. Let's give him a round of applause. And I also want to introduce and thank Don Curdy, who Don, if you raise your hand, and his mother, June Watkins Gardner, right next to him, for coming forward and sharing information about their family and the history of the house at that time, whenever they occupied it between the 1920s to the 1940s. And June was actually born in this house in 1924. So we have a lot of information thanks to them. For any architects in the audience, it's okay. For any architects in the audience, this tour is worth one hour of HSW continuing education credit through the American Institute of Architects. If anybody is interested in getting that credit, you can see me after the tour. Located in the MacArthur Park Historic District, the Roselle Murphy House was built in 1887 as a one and a half story Queen Anne style cottage. Over the years, the house was enlarged with craftsman style additions and the original front porch was replaced with what you see today, a little colonial revival style portico and an open air patio. So I'm gonna give you a lot of history on the people that lived in this house and then we can look around. This house was built in 1887 by George F. Roselle, owner of the Roselle Brokerage and Commercial Company on East Markham Street. Prior to building this house, Roselle lived in a house at the northwest corner of Scott and 13th which is now a parking lot over here, Caddy Corner, from where we are right now. The Roselle Murphy House was constructed on two and a half lots and was originally a much smaller house. Designed in the Queen Anne style with the corner turret that I'm sure you've all noticed, the red brick home, it was red brick originally, featured a wraparound porch support, supported by turned wooden posts. Roselle lost the house to foreclosure in 1895 and the property was acquired by W.B. Worthen and his wife, Molly. Roselle leased the house to Worthen for about one year, and then in 1897, the George W. Murphy family moved into 1301 Scott, this house, under a similar lease arrangement. Now about Colonel Murphy, as he was known. It was a very, very interesting and colorful character. There's a picture of him right over there on the wall, which you can see. Maybe good chance. Yep, right over there by Alan. Okay, so he was called Colonel Murphy. George Washington Murphy was born on January 8, 1841 at Huntington, Tennessee, and lived there until May 1861 when he enlisted at the outbreak of the Civil War and the first Confederate company organized in his county. Murphy was wounded during the battles of Shiloh, Murfreesboro, and at Harrisburg. Murphy suffered an injury to his right leg in 1864 at Harrisburg, which permanently disqualified him from future military service, but he remained with the Confederate forces until the end of the war. In the fall of 1865, Murphy rode horseback from Memphis to Hamburg in Ashley County, Arkansas, where he studied law under local attorney W.D. Moore. Now why he chose Hamburg, I have no idea. There must have been some connection though to go that far on horseback. I guess he commuted back and forth. No, no, he stayed there. He stayed in Ashley County. He was admitted to the bar in 1866 in Warren in Bradley County, Arkansas, and he practiced law at Hamburg until 1877. Murphy then moved to Hot Springs, where he practiced with James B. Wood and E.W. Rector. He moved to Little Rock in 1890 and partnered with Thomas B. Martin in the firm of Martin and Murphy and later joined T.M. Mahaffey in the firm of Murphy and Mahaffey. The latter firm was dissolved when Colonel Murphy was elected Arkansas's Attorney General, serving in that capacity from 1901 to 1905. Murphy was a successful criminal attorney, and he was known for being very dramatic in the courtroom. 
A local circuit court judge called Murphy, quote, invincible in jury trials. Mm -hmm. You'll recall that Colonel Murphy badly injured his leg during the Civil War. Well, he often exaggerated his limp to gain sympathy for his clients from the jury. And my favorite story about him, Murphy also had a trick pocket watch, which he would open at a strategic time during the trial. And the inner workings of the watch would fly out everywhere, naturally drawing the jury's attention from whatever the prosecutor was saying at that time. And then Murphy would scramble around the room and try to pick up all the pieces and put them back together. I dropped my keys today. Uh, see? Still do it. In 1912, Murphy ran for governor of Arkansas on the Progressive Party ticket, but Joseph Taylor Robinson won that election in a landslide and then soon vacated the seat. Colonel Murphy was senior partner in the firm of Murphy, McHaney, and Dunaway until his death on October 11, 1920, after a short illness. He was 79 years old. The funeral was held here in the family home at 1301 Scott, and his body was sent to Hot Springs for burial. Now rewind back to 1897, whenever the Murphy family first moved into this house, started leasing it in 1897. George Murphy and his wife, Sally Halton Murphy, had six children who lived here in the house with them. They were Grace Murphy, Elizabeth Bessie Murphy Armistead, Sarah Sadie Murphy Blakesley, Jenny Murphy, Samuel Murphy, and Leon Murphy Cooper. Sally Murphy, his wife, died in 1901 after a long illness, and he never remarried. In 1904, Murphy bought the house from W.B. Worthen for $9,500. Sometime between 1904 and 1913, Murphy added a few rooms to the northeast corner of the house, so over here on this side. After George Murphy's death in 1920, his heirs sold the property in 1921 to Thomas R. Smallwood. And this is when we get into talking about Miss June's family. <laughs> a native of Frederick, Maryland, Thomas Radford Smallwood moved to Little Rock in 1873, and he worked as an independent fire insurance adjuster. In 1921, he married Blanche Mivelis, and the couple purchased the Roselle Murphy House for $13,500. Tom Smallwood spent a small fortune at that time, between forty dollars and $45,000 to do an extensive remodeling of this house. He hired Little Rock architect William Dill to supervise the project. A two-story craftsman-style addition was added to the south side of the house. Go back through that room and you'll see the two-story craftsman-style addition. And that contained a solarium or a sunroom on the first floor and a sleeping porch on the second floor. A small porch on the north side of the house over here, which you can see in a little bit, was enclosed with windows. And then the biggest change, you're gonna find this hard to believe, but all of this was done at that time too. This would have been just the ceiling of the house going across here. Wow. He opened up what was already a very large attic and then added several dormers around the roof to make it a full second floor. So the grand staircase that I'm on, all of these details with the columns and the mezzanine, that all dates from the early 1920s, right after Smallwood purchased the property. Smallwood then hired Little Rock artist Ben Brantley to apply stenciling and painted decoration to the frieze of all the interior walls. And Brantley lived at 501 East 8th. He was a very successful painter here in Little Rock, and he hung around with the likes of Adrian Brewer, Charlie May Simon, and John Gould Fletcher. About 1927, Smallwood removed the original wooden front porch from the house and replaced it with what is there today, an uncovered brick and concrete patio with a colonial revival style portico at the front door entrance. Now one might ask, why do all this remodeling and enlarging of the house for two people? Well, Smallwood didn't get married till he was about 60 years old, and he was really excited to have all of this new family and he wanted them all to live with him. He wanted to be surrounded by his new family. So he moved four generations of his wife's family into the Roselle Murphy house. Blanche Mivelez Smallwood, her father, Frank Mivelez, was born in Switzerland to French parents. 
They were from Alsace, France, or Alsace, Lorraine, France, excuse me. And Frank Mibelez came to the U.S. in 1852, and he came to Arkansas in 1888. So you had the following people living in the house all at one time. There were nine of them. You had Frank and Catherine Mibelez. And that would have been June's, Miss June's great grandparents. You had Tom and Blanche Smallwood, who owned the house. And Blanche was a daughter of Frank and Catherine Middleys, and would have been a great aunt to June. You had Ami Middleys, who was also a daughter of Frank <coughs> and Catherine, and another great aunt to June, Blanche's sister. And then you also had John and Miriam Watkins. Miriam was the granddaughter of Frank and Catherine Middleys and June's mother. And then you had June and her sister Miriam Watkins, daughters of John and Miriam Watkins. And then you had a garage with living quarters over here on the southeast corner of the property that's no longer extant, and that's where the help lived. And the Smallwood Middleys uh, Watkins family had two people that were hired to work for them, Riola Spencer and a man named Parker. 1928 was a very difficult year for the family, especially for Blanche Smallwood. Her husband, Tom Smallwood, died on October 12, 1928, here at the house. He was only 68. Then Frank Middleis, her father, died one month later, on November 11, 1928. Several members of the Middleis family were in the restaurant and hotel business in Little Rock. In 1893, Louis Middleis, who did not live here, but he was a brother of Frank, who did live in this house. Louis was president of the Middleton's Hotel Company, proprietors of the Capitol Hotel. At that time, Frank Middleton, who lived here later, but in 1893, he was the chef at the Capitol Hotel, and Frank later became part owner of the Capitol Hotel. And Louis Middleton, interestingly, died in 1918 during the flu epidemic. In 1915, Ami Middleton, who lived here, daughter of Frank, owned and operated the Middleton's Cafe at 117 North Victory Street in Little Rock. But Frank's daughter, Blanche Middleton Smallwood, was probably the most enterprising cook in the family. In the 1930s, during the Great Depression, Blanche and her sister, Ami, opened a small French restaurant here in the Roselle Murphy house. And it was called the Middleton's Tea Room. And it was accessed through a door on the north side of the house and had an address on 13th Street. By 1940, Blanche had opened the Alamo Plaza Grill at 3200 Roosevelt Road. It was next to the Alamo Plaza Hotel Courts, and Blanche ran the restaurant for 18 years. I know some of you guys remember the Alamo Plaza Hotel Courts. In 1942, the Smallwood Middleton Watkins family moved to 1722 Broadway, and Blanche Smallwood sold the Roosevelt Murphy House to a Mrs. Mary Nelson who lived here with her son and daughter-in-law and also rented out rooms because it was a huge house. In 1953, Dixie Life and Accident Insurance Company purchased the house and used it for offices. So this house has been used as office space since 1953. Dixie remained in the house until 1967 and the house sat vacant for a few years. In 1970, it was purchased by Thomas Baxley who did the first major restoration of the house and put his insurance business here, Baxley and Associates. In the mid-70s, John Brittenham bought the property and had Brittenham and Associates, his investment services here. Brittenham and Associates hired Little Rock architect F. Eugene Withrow in 1977 to design an addition to the southeast corner of the house. It was a second story addition only, and it's supported by huge brick columns on this back corner. So you'll see that whenever you go outside, you can easily spot that 1977 edition. And Withrow may have also done a couple other additions on the north and the east sides of the house. From the mid-1980s to present, the house has been home to several different types of professional offices, including psychologists, psychiatrists, attorneys, physicians, and even a calligrapher. The Emerson Pointer Law Firm bought the house in February of 2013 and did six months of renovation work and remodeling. The firm moved into the house in July 2013. Now some interesting details before we look around. June Watkins Gardner, Miss June over here, and her sister, Miriam Watkins, 
were born in the house in the 1920s, and June remembered having a pony and chickens in the backyard. <laughs> George W. Murphy's daughters, Sarah and Elizabeth, were each married in the first floor tower room back here, back in that room, in the little tower area, the curved area where the tower is on the front. They were married in there. Both of their weddings took place in 1903. Sarah married Harry Blakesley and Elizabeth married Henry Marshall Armistead. And June's sister, Miriam Watkins, married Bob Cook of Cook Auto in the house a few decades later. The house has an area of more than 7,000 square feet, features original windows in a lot of the places, some with wavy glass, oak floors, some of the original crown molding, and wrought iron fence outside, which I'm sure you all noticed whenever you came in. The mantles and light fixtures are not original, and there's some new uh, faux press tin in some of these rooms, like in this office over here to my right. And also in the, in the kitchen, you'll notice the corrugated metal ceiling that's not original either. The house was not, on the exterior, was not painted white originally. It was red brick. The first floor rooms, the way they laid out by 1939 at least, in the area that you can see right here, you had John's office, which is that room, the first room on the right. That one was the family parlor. And then the next office of his, this room here, first of all, those two rooms were connected by a big set of pocket doors originally. And this room here was a formal parlor. You had a family parlor, kind of informal. And then the formal parlor was in this room. The bedrooms and an office were back in the back part. The kitchen was directly behind me underneath the stairs back there. There was a breakfast room in the northeast corner, the far corner up here. And then this office in here, Scott's office now, that was a huge dining room. And there's another set of pocket doors where this wall is to connect these two rooms on this side. And then that was another front room, another front parlor um, with the tower room in that room. And the tower room, as it was called, was also called the courting parlor by the Murphy family because George Murphy's daughters, he had five of them, they would visit with their bows in the little tower area while a chaperone would kind of watch and look on from the larger room. Um, I want to tell you guys something I thought was really, really cool, and I was able to share some copies of the stuff I found with June and with Dawn, but whenever I was looking through doing all my research on the house, whenever the Quapaw Quarter Association announced they were going to do a tour of the Roselle Murphy House in 1978, June's mother, Miriam Watkins, came forward and said, you know, my family lived here, and I can tell you. <laughs> Airport. Bro. 
It's just plastic that's been made. Thank you.